Hi, welcome back. I'm Dr. Goldcamp, Kidney Naturopath. Today, I want to talk to you about epigenomics, which is really what we've been talking about all along. I'm going to go a little deeper so you understand the importance of why we're testing what we're testing, why we're looking at nutrients, why we're looking at polymorphisms, why we're looking at specific gene alleles. Okay, so you remember last time we talked about the methylation cycle, folate cycle. Collectively, this often people refer to this together as the methylation cycle, and that there are three genomic bottlenecks. They're very common in people, so they're called common polymorphisms. MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. MTRR, which is actually two enzymes or two genes for two different enzymes. Methionine synthase and methionine synthase reductase. And then CBS, cystathione beta synthase. I know it sounds Greek to you. Don't worry about it. Just consider it three different enzymes that have different mutations, and some of these mutations are problematic for the people who have them, and it happens to be a lot of people have them. Okay, so that's where we're starting, is to know whether what your mutations are for these particular genes. And then we went into, hey, this is what it looks like on a genomic report from one of a number of companies, the companies that we like to look at, so the MTHFR, the MTRR, and the CBS, these different levels here are the two different common mutations. You also can call them alleles, common alleles, that provide the most problem for various people. This is the worst, if you will. This slows down the ability of this particular enzyme to function a lot. This slows down this particular enzyme less so. And if you're homozygous, meaning homozygous, you have it on both, you got it from your dad, you got it from your mom, it is it is impaired. And so then you look at the next gene, the MTRR. And in this particular individual, he also has a double homozygous. So it's double impaired. And then the CBS, not so much, but there is one mutation there. So what would we expect if somebody had this kind of equipment in their life but the idea being that these particular three enzymes are critical for a process called methylation. We're going to get into what is methylation, what does it do, why is it important. But these three enzymes are pretty critical for this particular process to work. And methylation happens about a billion times a second in our body. So it's pretty important globally throughout our whole body and for life in general, by the way, of other species. Okay. So that's what the report looks like, and this is a person who is more impaired than others. So now we're looking at a different way of representing this. We're saying, well, some of these enzymes, that particular person had, that one was not functioning well, that one was not functioning well, this one was impaired as well. So there would be a lot of processes that this particular individual would have impaired. And by the way, that is not a very unusual individual to have that situation. So last time I talked about each cycle as being a rotary, a traffic cycle. And that by not having it work out very well, in essence, you have a traffic jam where you have gridlock. And I asked, what does metabolic gridlock look like? Well, it looks like a problem. It means when you have this kind of metabolic, these specifically genetic, genomic mutations, like this individual had, you more than likely are gonna have a history of addiction, diabetes perhaps, maybe cleft lip, maybe spina bifida history in your family, maybe autism history in your family, maybe dyslexia for you in particular. I mean, these are things you can't really see genetically, but you'll know if the person is dyslexic or not. I myself am homozygous for MTHFR, and that has been a problem all my life. My other siblings don't have it as severely as I have it. Well, lucky them, right? But that's how it works. But there's things that you can do to deal with that, to make it less of an issue, less of an obstacle. And that's that's the amazing, really interesting thing for the last two decades, if not the last three or four years. Okay, so let's go on from there. Here's another person who has a much less significant interruption of these particular enzymes, and they probably wouldn't notice anything. So why we're looking into this and why it's worth looking into this? In a word, it's called epigenetics. These particular mutations of these particular enzymes mutations of the genes of these particular enzymes have to do with the process called methylation. What is methylation? Methylation is the ability 
of your body to turn certain genes on and off. And how it turns genes off is by methylating them. It tags them with a methyl group. It tags them and it shuts them off. It doesn't destroy them, it just quiets them. That's the difference between your liver and your eyeball, your tooth and your toenail. It's the ability to express those genes in the appropriate location and at the appropriate time that makes for methylation being pretty much the key process in our life. You can never say that about anything, but it's very important. If you have a poorly functioning methylating process, the ability to methylate genes, turn them off and turn them on, the problem comes up this way. If you have genes that are under-methylated, right, they haven't been methylated enough, they're going to turn on. And maybe they shouldn't be turning on. There's certain cancer genes that shouldn't be turning on. There's certain other genes that shouldn't be turning on. And so that is the problem. And so much like this picture of the piano, that is, how do you play music if the keys are always on or off? Or how do you play music on a piano if you have no control over when to turn a key on? So think of, let's say, Beethoven. Bum, 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 bum. Nice. And it goes on. And is that his eighth symphony? I don't know. And now you have some extraneous keys there that are just willy-nilly going on and going off. That would totally destroy his music. That's how it is with us in our individual lives. Our ability to play our own music, to live our own life, to sing our own song, so on and so forth, it's more than an analogy. It's kind of a half reality, is a problem. It will mean that this compromised function of your methylation system, your methylation process, is going to compromise the thing that's called epigenetics. The ability to turn on certain genes in an appropriate time, in an appropriate place, and turn them off in an appropriate time, in an appropriate space. That has to do with hormones. That has to do with neurotransmitters. That's why there's an addiction history for these impairments or these impediments. But if they only knew where to look for what mutations exist where, you'd know how to support them perhaps more than others, other genes and enzymes with the nutrients. It's a fascinating story. It absolutely is. It's cutting edge in my view. And I think this is how medicine should be practiced. So now I need to tell you about a person who basically brought all of humanity into modern life, that is understanding epigenetics. So we could have the exact same genes, you and I, he and myself, but we could have different expressions. How do we do that? How can we have different genes? How can we have the same genes and have different expressions? That's the process of methylation, and that's what they call epigenomics. What are the genes that are expressed? How are they read? When are they read? And all that process. It's not as complicated as you think. Just think of on and off. Methylation turns off genes. Not being methylated allows the genes to function. The enzyme, whatever those genes are, hormones, enzymes. So Dr. Randy Jurdle, PhD, did an experiment back in 2003, 2002 about mice. And it was the mice called agouti mice. The agouti, and so they were a specific gene line of mice. And the agouti mice means, obviously, they have the agouti gene. And the agouti gene is responsible for the hair color of mice. Rather complicated biochemistry, but responsible for the hair color of mice. And so what he proposed was, hmm, why don't we have two groups of female mice and feed them mice chow? It's kind of like kibbles for mice. And but I'm going to differentiate it a little bit. In one group, I'm going to give them what they call methyl donors. I'm going to give them pieces of the methylation cycle, right? Components of the methylation cycle so that we are guaranteed that their methylation ability to methylate is going to work probably better than the group that wasn't given these methyl donors. So he fed them this. They then conceived and they had offspring. And they found out that the diet that had no methyl donors in it were yellow, fat, obese, and prone to cancer. Those who were given the methyl donors, and methyl donors, by the way, are vitamins, nutrients, they're B12, folic acid, esidental, methionine, choline, trimethylglycine, otherwise known as betaine. Who cares, right? It's stuff that supports the methyl cycle, methylation. Okay, so we found that, wow, 
gave the supplements to one, but not to the other, and they turned out incredibly healthy, the ones that didn't have these particular methyl donors turned out unhealthy and obese and prone to various cancers. So let me go back. Remember, the unmethylated genes are the ones that can kind of express themselves. Maybe they shouldn't be expressing themselves. Maybe they should be methylated. And maybe in these particular mice, there wasn't enough of these methylating factors. And therefore, genes that should have been quiet, benched for the process, so to say, were now expressing themselves. And that's true. You have things called oncogenes. You have other genes. It goes on and on and on. And that's why when we looked at those genomic reports of humans and their genome and those who had the worst allele, the worst mutation of these various enzymes, the genes for these various enzymes, had the greatest and worst family histories and personal histories of diseases and disorders in their particular life. Okay then, that was pretty groundbreaking. Groundbreaking to the point that everybody who could, and it's a pretty simple experiment, right? It wasn't real complicated, not a lot of high technology, pretty straightforward, so anybody could do it. So they all did do it. For the next decade, they were doing his experiment again and again and again and again, and they found the same results. Fascinating. We got a little more subtlety in there, but it was fascinating to the point that Dr. Jertle, PhD, was man of the year for time in 2007, and he was given the Linus Pauling Award in 2014. So that's a big deal. Okay, then. So you think that he's done, moved on, and maybe he's doing something else. No, about 10 years later, not quite, but in 2010, he did another experiment, pretty much the same one. And what he did this time is that he did two groups of mice, the agouti mice, same situation. They both had chow. But what he did this time is that he gave them both a methylation blocker toxin. So the methylation blocker toxin was a thing called BPH. We all know it because it's leached from plastics. It was invented or created in the 1950s with epoxy. And then from epoxy, the polycarbonate bottles we see when you go to the gym or you, uh, they're all over the place. You know, all the containers that we buy things in that are not glass are polycarbonate. And so in the polycarbonate bottles, containers, leached out a thing called BPA, bisphenol A. It's called a phthalate. There's now a whole category of things called phthalates. And BPA has supposedly been outlawed and they've made substitutes. But the problem is, they're equally problematic. They're equally toxic. But get to the bottom line, the BPA as an environmental toxin was invented and created in the 1950s. He knew that in some species, it blocked the methylation process. So he thought, well, it would be ideal. I'll give both mice BPA. So I'm going to give them chow and I'm going to give them BPA. So their methylation system is not going to work. And in one group, I'm going to give the methyl donors, right? The B12 folic acid, S uh, SAM, we call it SAMI, S uh, adenylmethionine, and uh, betaine, trimethylglycine, and choline, gave these other factors. What did he find? I'm waiting. What he found was the same results. The BPA with no methylating factors clearly had a very broken methylation process. They were born, you give it to the mothers, by the way, right? Through the pregnancy and so on and so forth. They found yellow, they, they grew up to be yellow fur, fat, obese, and prone to cancers, where the others were smaller, brown, and lived a healthy life. So there's two takeaways here. One is about environmental toxins and how there's a lot of environmental toxins. And by the way, BPA is what they call an endocrine disrupting compound. And it's a whole category of endocrine disrupting compounds that they know, that they've known about at least that aspect of those particular compounds since the 1970s, even though it was created in the 50s. So not only have endocrine disrupting compounds block your methylation process, which is your ability for your body to turn genes on and off as they need, but they also interrupt hormonal aspects and processes as well. So I think it was clever that he chose that 
because he made two statements at once. One, the other statement was, you take these methylating factors, you take your supplements, and you can overcome some of your environmental toxic exposures. The other mice that did not have the methylating factors and just the toxic exposure of BPA really represents most of the population of the United States, in my view, I don't know about humanity, but the United States that are exposed to these toxic substances through their food, utensils, and so on and so forth, and it does affect their metabolism. Specifically, it affects their ability to methylate. It specifically, it affects their ability to turn genes on or off. With that, I wanted to continue just a little bit on the toxic exposure aspect of this experiment because it's profound. And this specifically is his experiment called epigenomic disruption, which is what I described to you. The effects of early developmental exposures. So is the fact that these BPA was exposed in vivo in the fetus of the mice through the mother's diet. There was another article basically looking at this experiment and making it a little more clever and said, you are what your mother ate or was exposed to or what she didn't eat, right? Lack of methylating methyl donors. So this aspect is profound, absolutely profound. So some of you are listening and saying, what does this have to do with a keto naturopath and keto and so on and so forth? Well, we will bring it around to that. Too much information in any one video, it's kind of tough to go by. So that we have that. And I want to introduce you to this specific website. I think it's great. Um, Theo Coburn died a number of years ago. My, she's one of my heroes of my life. But she began a, um, a website and a program called TEDx. And it's called the Endocrine Disruption Exchange. Basically, if you plug in BPA, you'll learn how problematic it is for so many people. And I think it's important to pick up that message as well. Not just that methylation is, is interrupted, which is the effects of BPA, but the endocrine disrupting aspects of it as well. I think you'll be really interested. So that's TEDx, Endocrine Disruption Exchange. I'll put that into the show notes. And with that, I'm going to close for now and then get back to nutrition and your genome and what we can do about it next week. Take care. Bye-bye.